morning to all of you. Oh, it's a live audience. That's <laughs> wonderful. So the great, the really cool thing about being somebody who teaches film and media studies, it's not that I get to watch movies and TV for a living, although that helps. It's not that I get to write my Netflix bill off on my taxes, although <laughs> that helps also. But what it is, is that I get to look at the culture that we all take for granted, that we all sometimes think of as just entertainment, and really take it seriously, and really think about what it does, how it works, how it means in our culture. And the really cool thing about it is that when my students get it, when I see that my students understand that there's something going on that's more than just entertainment, that's really, really cool. That's really cool. And that's part of what I want to share with all of you today, is a part of that work that I'm really passionate about, which is my work on race and stars. Um, my interest in stardom really stems from the fact that stars tell stories. They certainly tell stories in a really straightforward way. They're in movies that have plots, that have narratives. But stars also tell us stories about who we are as a culture. Stars, by virtue of their popularity, by the kinds of roles they inhabit, by the way that they perform, by the way that we receive them, tell stories about us. And that's what I think is really fascinating about them. Now, my work on stardom is really influenced by two really important thinkers. The first is a really amazing British film scholar by the name of Richard Dyer. And Richard Dyer says that stars matter because they act out aspects of life that matter to us. And performers get to be stars when what they act out matters to enough people. Now, in some ways, this is kind of a simplistic explanation. There are ways we can sort of take issue with it, but it's a really straightforward way of thinking about stars as vehicles for ideology. Stars as carriers of ideas, of beliefs, of wishes, of fears, of anxieties that we collectively hold as a culture. And so, in the framework that I want to give you all today in thinking about stars, ideology is one prong. So we think about stars as vehicles for ideology. On the other side is the influence from another really great thinker, the African-American essayist, James Baldwin. And James Baldwin has an amazing book called The Devil Finds Work that he wrote in 1976. And he says, the distance between oneself, the audience, and movie stars is an absolute, a paradoxical absolute masquerading as intimacy. This is Baldwin's typical poetic prose. It's really beautiful. And what he's saying here, what he goes on to say is that nobody really knows if Humphrey Bogart or Katherine Hepburn, Clark Gable or Betty Davis could act. No one was interested in their acting. What we go to the movies to see, we don't go to the movies to watch them act, we go to the movies to watch them be. And so that idea of intimacy is the idea that we learn something essential about them. We know who they are. We have a sense of them as people. Now, Baldwin is talking about these classic stars, but I think that we can think of contemporary movie stars in the same way that one doesn't go to the movies to see them act, one goes to the movies to watch them be. And I think some, a, another really good example of this is the death of Robin Williams and Lauren Bacall last summer. There was a way that many of us felt that loss very personally, because we felt that these were people that we knew, and we felt that we knew something about them. I think it's particularly poignant with Robin Williams' death of an apparent suicide, because it really contradicted our sense of him as a happy, joyous, madcap kind of personality that we saw in so many of his films. And so that idea of intimacy is really an essential part of how we understand stars. And so when I think about this in terms of ideology, in terms of intimacy, when we throw the concept of race into that mix, it becomes very complicated. And there are two questions that I like to ask. 
one about ideology and one about intimacy that has to do with race. In terms of ideology, how does America's dominant ideology about race shape, limit, constrict what African-American stars can be or cannot be in film, who they can play, who they cannot play? That's on the ideology side. On the intimacy side, the question about intimacy is, what kinds of intimacy are black stars obliged to form with an assumed white audience? And what I mean by that is that because most Hollywood studio executives are white, and because for the most part they're writing when they write for an assumed white audience, what does that intimacy look like? What kind of being are we looking for in African-American stars? Now, because I think it can be easier to reckon with questions like this from kind of a remove, I'm going to start with an example to think about this that's almost 80 years old. Um, the first person I want us to think about is Hattie McDaniel. Hattie McDaniel was the first African-American to win, to be nominated for, and to win an Academy Award for her 1939 performance in the film Gone with the Wind. And in that film, she played a character whose name was Mammy. That was the character's name. And that was also the icon that she was playing. What I mean by that is Mammy was an idea in America at this time. Mammy was an idea that really made it possible for Hollywood and for America writ large to have a kind of cultural nostalgic affair with slavery. Mammy as an icon of slavery turned slavery from a system of human bondage, a system of human oppression, into kind of a family affair. If we understand slavery through the icon of Mammy, then we're not thinking about the way that slavery historically and typically separated African-American families. We're not thinking about the way that slavery created a divide in this country that persists to this day. We're thinking about slavery as family, as intimacy. And so there's a way then that that intimacy carries an ideology. I think McDaniel gives us a really, really instructive example of that. And we can carry that forward and think about the way that a lot of contemporary stars have a same kind of burden of carrying an ideology through intimacy. Not to say that they are mammies or stereotypes in some sort of straightforward way, but to say that their roles, their performances, tell us something about ideology and tell us something about where we, how we think about African Americans, the kinds of wishes, the kinds of hopes, the kinds of fears that circulate in our dominant racial ideology. And so I think a really great example of this in terms of contemporary culture is the comedian Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart, in the last six months, has been in two incredibly similar movies. Um, the Wedding Ringer, which came out in January of this year with, Josh, with Kevin Hart and Josh Gad, and then the recent movie Get Hard um, with Will Ferrell that came out in March of this year. In both of these films, and you'll notice the tagline for The Wedding Ringer is the best man money can buy. The plot in both of these films is that Kevin Hart is a kind of professional black best friend to white men. <laughs> That's the plot. <laughs> That's what we've got. And the similarity of these two films and their, their extreme popularity tells us a lot about the meaning of blackness, about the meaning of black stardom. And I'll talk about Get Hard just specifically a bit. The, the, the plot of this film is that Will Ferrell is a rich businessman who has been convicted of fraud and who's been sentenced to 10 years in prison in a maximum security institution. He is terrified, understandably, and he hires Kevin Hart to act as his consultant, to teach him how to survive on the inside, the things he's going to need to know to make it in the yard, basically. Um, now, on the one hand, the film sort of wants to have it both ways. 
we are un made to understand explicitly that Kevin Hart has never been incarcerated, <laughs> and that the joke is kind of on Will Ferrell, who is a character who's somewhat clueless, who has his own preconceived notions about race. He comes to the conclusion that Kevin Hart must have been incarcerated because he's working at as a car washer in his building, he must be not very well educated, and so on. So the joke is supposed to be on him, but at the same time, the entire movie, we spend 90 minutes watching Kevin Hart pretend to have been incarcerated. And I think what this movie really does is gives us a sense of the way that ideology can provide an outlet for certain kinds of anxieties. The, the idea that black men and women are disproportionately incarcerated in this country is a very real problem. It's a very real thing. And there's a way that Get Hard sort of has its cake and eats it too, in that it plays with that tension without addressing it in a way that's at all straightforward. So again, we have this intimacy between Kevin Hart and Will Ferrell that develops over the course of this movie, but it's an intimacy that carries an ideology with it. I want to conclude with one last example that's a kind of a different example of stardom it's really an example of celebrity and the kind of celebrity that really has emerged in this moment of handheld camera phones, of Vimeo, of YouTube, of Vine, um, of social media of all sorts, and also the 24-hour news cycle and the kind of way that the hunger for content is so central to that. Um, as I was preparing this talk, Last week, I was watching with a lot of interest the celebrity that was, I guess we could say, foisted upon Toya Graham. Toya Graham is the mom in Baltimore who caught her teenage son throwing rocks at the police in a protest over the police killing of Freddie Gray. And when she found him, she she went off on him. She slapped him in the head. She grabbed him. She pulled him out of this protest. She was very, very angry, and she was, you know, distressed that her son was there. And in a way, I want to be clear that I don't take issue necessarily with what Toya Graham did, but what I'm interested in is the way that making her a celebrity does a lot of things for a culture that's really grappling with the meaning of the protests and the uprisings in Baltimore. When we celebrate Toya Graham, uncritically, there's a way that we downplay aspects of her story. We downplay the fact that she herself says this was not an instance of great parenting. But when we call for her to be mother of the year based on this, we ignore that. When we celebrate her uncritically, we ignore or downplay the fact that she said she did this because she was terrified that her son would become another Freddie Gray. She was afraid that the police would kill her son too. But when we celebrate that uncritically, we don't necessarily pay attention to that. When we celebrate her uncritically and turn her into a celebrity, we say that the take-home message should be that all the protesters' moms or dads should have come out and grabbed them and snatched them up, as opposed to paying attention to why they were out there in the first place. So that Toya Graham as a celebrity becomes a kind of convenient distraction for a larger, more complicated, and more troubling story. So that the ideology that gets carried by that intimacy, and that is an intimate moment, that Toya Graham was having with her son, the moment of her fear, the moment of her disciplining him. And when we use that intimacy to carry the ideology that the protesters are wrong, and the protesting is the problem, as opposed to the problem of police brutality, the problem of community policing in urban neighborhoods all over America, that's a, that's a moment where intimacy carries a particularly ide particular ideology that we have to be attentive to. So I want to close by asking you to think about these ideas 
of intimacy, about ideology, and how these ideas converge in the bodies of people that we watch on the news, in the movies, on the internet, and about the terms of that intimacy for you, for the stars themselves. I want to ask you to think about some questions that I always try to ask when I see, when I see stars. How is this person like other stars that I know, or how are they different? Why is this the person that I'm seeing, as opposed to another person right now? What ideas about race, about gender, about sexuality, about class, about Americanness, about masculinity or femininity are wrapped up in this performance that I'm seeing right now? I think that when we do that, we get clearer, even as we're seeing stars, that there's something more profound going on than just entertainment. <laughs>